Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Laura Hillenbrand said in her book, Unbroken, a World War II story of survival, resilience, and redemption. I quote, Dignity is as essential to human life as water, food, and oxygen. Dignity is as essential to human life as water, food, and oxygen. The stubborn retention of it, even in the face of extreme physical hardship, can hold a man's soul in his body long past the point at which the body should have surrendered it. Brilliant quote indeed. I personally value this concept and believe in it. I owe so much respect to the people who are dignified and cannot be bought whatsoever. I would like to give you some examples. For example, since the eruption of the CIA-backed regime change war in Syria, I personally received a lot of temptations and a lot of opportunities, whether it's job opportunities, scholarships, status prizes and lifting your ego, inviting you to conferences, inviting you to important events, etc., etc. Just the request from the other side was join our side and become an oppositionist. And because I am ethnic Armenian and I have a Christian background, so you become more valuable for them because if you say, if you oppose the Syrian regime and you ask for its overthrow or removal, you may have influence over the younger generation or the or your own generation because you're considered an intellectual among them, right? And this has never stopped. Even after 2019, um, I moved in Berlin and I was uh, brutally smeared, attacked by the German mainstream media, state-funded state media, actually. And I received, again, temptations. I received uh, messages. I received letters from people telling me that if you, it's still uh, not too late to join the Syrian revolution. If you want to join the Syrian revolution, we will stop the media campaigns against you. And uh, because of the media campaigns, I was attacked multiple times physically. And if anyone would be attacked regularly on the streets or harassed verbally, you would think twice to say what, what you want to say in public or online, right? but I didn't stop there. And then they came after me again and they threatened me with deportation from Germany and they um, did all they can legally and illegally in order to deport me from Germany. And all, all after all this, I didn't back off because I believe that my dignity is the most important thing and I believe that it's better to die on your feet than crawl on your knees. And I'm not trying to be a martyr here, but I was a victim because of my political choices. And I believe my political choice is the correct one. And I'm ready to defend this cause and these values. So I do what I do because I believe I'm a dignified person and I want to preserve that. And I don't want to bow to the pressure. Now, why I'm giving all this cheesy introduction? Because after World War II, I mean, this is historical cycle, but especially um, our because our example is about uh, after World War II. After World War II, some nations were and still enslaved ideologically, and they are submitted morally to the victors. And the victors after World War II were the allies. And mostly the United States, because the Soviet Union has collapsed now, and the United States is still uh, a superpower, and it's an empire, and it has... Uh, very huge influence over the world. And one of the examples, and I, look, I'm not going to, this is not a generalization. I owe so much respect to the Japanese people for their achievements uh, in their own country and everything they have done in terms of the economic successes, industries, and uh, playing an important financial role in the world. But still, uh, because in Japan, uh, they commemorated on Sunday, which was yesterday, the 78 years since the U.S. dropped atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And three days later, so apparently two days from now, um, bombed Nagasaki. And this is all known for the entire world. We have learned it in history books, but there are some details I want to discuss about this. The world's first and so far only wartime atomic bombings killed over 200,000 civilians. Now, what bothers me personally 
there are two things. Of course, the killing of the innocent people is very, very horrible thing. But the most important thing here is the people of, of Japan should uh, pursue justice for the civilians that uh, perished. <laughs> I mean, what? why would 200,000 civilians would die for the mistakes of their emperor back then, right? But they died. And now the people, unfortunately, they are not pursuing justice. And I'm still, I'm not generalizing, but I will show you some examples about that. Now, at the memorial ceremony, Japanese prime minister didn't even mention the United States as the perpetrator of this heinous crime. Uh, but rather, he mentioned the he mentioned Russia, actually. And uh, he said that the goal of a nuclear-free world has become, quote, more difficult due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and this is the exact exact quotation that I'm referring to. This is the article from the Washington Post. Japan on Hiroshima bombing anniversary decries Russia's nuclear threat. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Quote, as the only country to have experienced the horror of nuclear devastation in war, Japan will press on tirelessly with its efforts to bring about nuclear disarmament, Kishida said. The widening division within the international community over approaches to nuclear disarmament, the nuclear threat made by Russia and other concerns now make that road all the more difficult. And to be honest with you, uh, the nuclear threats made by, uh, by Russia is also... <clears throat> There is the context of it, which is the American and NATO expansion to the borders of uh, Russia and eventually installing nuclear weapons on the borders with Russia. So you cannot speak about the threat of Russia, uh, nuclear threat of Russia, without addressing the root cause, which is the expansion of NATO to the borders with Russia and installing nuclear weapons there. This is a recent video, apparently, uh, from Japan. I'm not sure the date of it. Um, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida speaking at a ceremony uh, marking the 78th anniversary of the atomic bombing never mentioned the United States as the country that carried out in 1945. This is what total submission looks like. This is... I I agree with him. Some Japanese basically thank the US. So these people basically, of course, this doesn't represent the entire Japanese people, but this video really bothered me because these Japanese people or these few individuals in this video, they are basically saying that the atomic bomb dropped by, two atomic bombs dropped by the United States on their own country, which killed over 200,000 people was worth it, basically, because I'm paraphrasing them, because it has uh, made the war, uh, or it fastened the uh, end of the war. Check. So the question here is, um, did Japan in the final days of World War II was intending, uh, was Japan intending to uh, retreat and uh, surrender? Did Japan want to continue fighting and why Japan uh, surrendered at the end? There is the mainstream narrative about it, that uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, Japan said, enough, I'm, I'm going to surrender. But is it really true? This is the uh, real question. And brace yourself, guys. I'm going to... Re- I, have, I have read a long historical article. This is from the Foreign Policy and uh, I summarize it for you. The title of the archi- uh, article says, The Bomb Didn't Beat Japan, Stalin Did. This was published in uh, 2013 in the Foreign Policy magazine. Unfortunately, it's paid, so you have to pay money in order to read it. But I print it, and I have read it. And I summarize it for you guys so that we learn together something probably new. Maybe some people do not know about these facts, but I was determined that to deliver this uh, uh, facts and information to you because on Syriana analysis, my uh, also goal is educational, as I mentioned a few times. So the bomb didn't beat Japan, Stalin did. It was written by Ward Wilson in the foreign policy. So this is not from a RT, Sputnik, or any, uh, let's say, Russian outlet. Few 
Only few people questioned President Truman's decision to drop two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But in 1965, historian Gar Alperovitz argued that although the bombs did force an immediate end to the war, Japan's leaders had wanted to surrender anyway and likely would have done so before the American invasion planned for November 1st. Their use was therefore unnecessary. In the years since, many others have joined the fray, some echoing Alperovitz and denouncing the bombing, others rejoining hotly that the bombings were moral, necessary, and life-saving. The United States bombed Hiroshima on August 6th and Nagasaki on August 9th, when the Japanese finally succumbed to the threat of further nuclear bombardment and surrendered. The support for this narrative runs deep, but there are three major problems with it. So we have this major, I would say, historical narrative and context, let's say, about what happened in Japan and why Japan surrendered. And the mainstream narrative is because the United States bombed uh, Hiroshima on the August 6th and Nagasaki on August 9th, and therefore after that, Japan surrendered. But there are three major problems with this narrative, and we're going to address them one by one. So brace yourself, guys. Timing. The first problem with the traditional interpretation is timing, and it is a serious problem. The traditional interpretation has a simple timeline. The U.S. Army Air Force bombs Hiroshima with a nuclear weapon on August 6th. Three days later, the bomb they bombed Nagasaki with another, and on the next day, the Japanese signaled their intention to surrender. Viewed from the Japanese perspective, the most important day in that second week of August wasn't August 6th, but August 9th. That was the day that the Supreme Council met for the first time in the war to discuss unconditional surrender. The Supreme Council was a group of six top members of the government, a sort of inner cabinet that effectively ruled Japan in 1945. Japan's leaders had not seriously considered surrendering prior to that day. Unconditional surrender, what the Allies were demanding, was a bitter pill to swallow. Even though, situa- even though the situation was bad in the summer of 1945, the leaders of Japan were not willing to consider giving up their traditions, their beliefs, or their way of life. Until August 9, what could have happened that caused them to suddenly and decisively change their minds? What made them sit down to seriously discuss surrender for the first time after 14 years of war? It could not have been Nagasaki. The bombing of Nagasaki occurred in the late morning of August 9th, after the Supreme Council had already began meeting to discuss surrender, and word of the bombing only reached Japan's leaders in the early afternoon after the meeting of the Supreme Council had been adjourned in deadlock and the full cabinet had been called to take up the discussion. Based on timing alone, Nagasaki can't have been what motivated them. Hiroshima isn't a very good candidate either. It came 74 hours more than three days earlier. What kind of crisis takes three days to unfold? First, Hiroshima's governor reported to Tokyo on the very day Hiroshima was bombed that about a third of the population had been killed in the attack and that two-thirds of the city had been destroyed. This information didn't change over the next several days, so the outcome the end result of the bombing, was clear from the beginning. Japan's leaders knew roughly the outcome of the attack on the first day, yet they still didn't act. Second, the preliminary report prepared by the army team that investigated the Hiroshima bombing, the one that gave details about what happened there, was not delivered until August 10th. It didn't reach Tokyo, in other words, until after the decision to surrender had already been taken. Third, the Japanese military understood, at least in a rough way, what nuclear weapons were. Japan had a nuclear weapons program. And finally, one other fact about timing creates a striking problem. On August 8, Foreign Minister Togo Shigenori went to Premier Suzuki Kantaro and asked that the Supreme Council be convened to discuss the bombing of Hiroshima, but its members declined. So the crisis didn't grow day by day until it finally burst into full bloom on August 9th. 
Any explanation of the actions of Japan's leaders that relies on the, quote, shock of the bombing of Hiroshima has to account for the fact that they considered a meeting to discuss the bombing on August 8th, made a judgment that it was too unimportant, and then suddenly decided to meet to discuss surrender the very next day. Either they succumbed to some sort of group schizophrenia, or some other event was the real motivation to discuss surrender which is most likely some other event happened here. So let's see. So the first thing was the timing, and the second was the scale of the attack, of the bombing, What, h- how much devastation this attack left. Historically, the use of the bomb may seem like the most important discrete event of the war. From the contemporary Japanese perspective, however, it might not have been so easy to distinguish the bomb from the other events. It is, after all, difficult to distinguish a single drop of rain in the midst of a hurricane. In the summer of 1945, the U.S. Army Air Force carried out one of the most intense campaigns of city destruction in the history of the world. 68 cities in Japan were attacked, and all of them were either partially or completely destroyed. An estimated 1.7 million people were made homeless, 300,000 were killed, and 750,000 were wounded. 66 of these raids were carried out with conventional bombs. Only two with atomic bombs. The destruction caused by conventional attacks was huge. We often imagine because of the way the the story is told that the bombing of Hiroshima was far worse. We imagine that the number of people killed was off the chart. But if you graph the number of people killed in all 68 cities bombed in the summer of 1945, you find that Hiroshima was second in terms of civilian deaths. If you chart the number of square miles destroyed, you find that Hiroshima was fourth. If you chart the percentage of the city destroyed, Hiroshima was 17th. In the three weeks prior to Hiroshima, 26 cities, Japanese cities, were attacked by the U.S. Army Air Force. Of this, of this, eight or almost a third were as completely or more completely destroyed than Hiroshima in terms of the percentage of the city destroyed. The fact that Japan had 68 cities destroyed in the summer of 45 poses a serious challenge for people who want to make the bombing of Hiroshima the cause for Japan's surrender. The question is, if they surrendered because a city was destroyed, why didn't they surrender when the other 66 cities were destroyed? A very legitimate question. If Japan's leaders were going to surrender because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you would expect to find that they cared about the bombing of cities in general, that the city attacks put pressure on them to surrender, but this doesn't appear to be so. So what's the strategic significance of this bombing? If the Japanese were not concerned with the city bombing in general or the atomic bomb of Hiroshima in particular, what were they concerned with? This is the real question, right? The answer is simple, the author says, the Soviet Union. The Japanese were in relatively difficult strategic situation. They were nearing the end of a war they were losing. Conditions were bad. The army, however, was still strong and well supplied. Nearly 4 million men were under arms and 1.2 million of those were guarding Japan's home islands. Even the most hardline leaders in Japan's government knew that the war could not go on. The question was not whether to continue, but how to bring the war to a close under the best terms possible. The Allies, here the United States, Great Britain and others, remember the Soviet Union was still here neutral, were demanding unconditional surrender. Japan's leaders hoped that they might be able to figure out a way to avoid war crimes trials, keep their form of government, and keep some of the territories they would conquer, for example, Korea, Vietnam, Burma, parts of Malaysia and Indonesia, a large portion of eastern China, and numerous islands in the Pacific. They had two plans for getting better surrender terms. They had, in other words, two strategic options. The first was diplomatic. Japan had signed a five-year neutrality pact with the Soviets in April of 1941, which would expire in 1946. A group consisting mostly of civilian leaders and led by Foreign Minister Togo Shigenori hoped that Stalin might be convinced to mediate a settlement between the United States and its allies 
on the other hand and Japan on the other. Even though this plan was a long shot, it reflected sound strategic thinking. After all, it would be in the Soviet Union's interests to make sure that the terms of the settlement were not too favorable to the United States because any increase in U.S. influence and power in Asia would mean a decrease in Russian power and influence. The second plan was military, and most of its proponents, led by the army minister Anami Korechika, were, mi were military men. They hoped to use Imperial Army ground troops to inflict high casualties on U.S. forces when they invaded. If they succeeded, they felt they might be able to get the United States to offer better terms. This strategy was also a long shot. The United States seemed deeply committed to unconditional surrender. But since there was in fact concern in U.S. military circles that the casualties in an invasion would be prohibitive, the Japanese high command strategy was not entirely off the mark. I know, guys, this is a little bit tall, long article, but it's a very good explanation and historical, and I believe uh, most of you appreciate this. One way to gauge whether it was the bombing of Hiroshima or the invasion and declaration of war by the Soviet Union that caused Japan's surrender is to compare the way in which these two events affected the strategic situation. After Hiroshima was bombed on August 6, both options were still alive. It would still have been possible to ask Stalin to mediate, and Tagaki's diaries entries from August 8 show that at least some of Japan's leaders were still thinking about the effort to get Stalin involved. So the diplomatic option was still on the table, even after the bombing of uh, Hiroshima. It would also still have been possible to try to fight one last decisive battle and inflict heavy casualties. The destruction of Hiroshima had done nothing to reduce the preparedness of the troops dug in on the beaches of Japan's home islands. There was now one fewer city behind them, but they were still dug in. They still had ammunition, and their military strength had not been diminished in any important way. Bombing Hiroshima didn't foreclose either of Japan's strategic options. The impact of the Soviet declaration of war and invasion of Manchuria and Sakhalin Island was quite different, however. Once the Soviet Union had declared war, Stalin could no longer act as a mediator. He was now a belligerent. So the diplomatic option was wiped out by the Soviet move. It didn't take a military genius to see that. While it might be possible to fight a decisive battle against one great power invading from one direction, it would not be possible to fight off two great powers attacking from two different directions. The Soviet invasion invalidated the military's decisive battle strategy just as, as it invalidated the diplomatic strategy. At a single stroke, all of Japan's options evaporated. The Soviet invasion was strategically decisive. It foreclosed both of Japan's options, while the bombing of Hiroshima, which foreclosed neither, was not the Soviet declaration of war also changed the calculation of how much time was left for maneuver. Japanese intelligence was predicting the U.S. forces might not invade for months. Soviet forces, on the other hand, could be in Japan proper in a little as 10 days. The Soviet invasion made a decision on ending the war extremely time sensitive. So... This is the last part, guys, a convenient story. Why Japan likes the story that um, the atomic bomb uh, was the reason that ended World War II or Japan's defeat and why the United States likes that story and why the Soviet Union doesn't really like that story. This is a really good explanation in my opinion and logical one. So let's dig in together. Despite the existence of these three powerful objections, the traditional interpretation still retains a strong hold on many people's thinking, particularly in the United States. There is real resistance to looking at the facts, but perhaps this should not be surprising. It is worth noting or reminding ourselves how emotionally convenient the traditional explanation of Hiroshima is, both for Japan and the United States. Ideas can have persistence because they are true, but unfortunately they can also persist because they are emotionally satisfying. They feel an important psychic need. For example, at the end of the war, the traditional interpretation of Hiroshima helped Japan's leaders achieve a number of important political aims, both domestic and international. So what are they? Put yourself in the shoes of the emperor. You have just led your country through a disastrous war. The economy is shattered. 
80% of your cities have been bombed and burned. The army has been pummeled in a string of defeats. The navy has been decimated and confined to ports. Starvation is looming. The war, in short, has been a catastrophe. And worst of all, you have been lying to your people about how bad the situation is. They will be shocked by the news of surrender. So which would you rather do? Admit that you failed badly? Issue a statement that says that you miscalculated spectacularly, made repeated mistakes and did enormous damage to the nation? Or would you rather blame the loss on an amazing scientific breakthrough that no one could have predicted? At a single stroke, blaming the loss of the war on the atomic bomb swept all the mistakes and misjudgments of the war under the rug. The bomb was the perfect excuse for having lost the war. No need to apportion blame, no court of inquiry need to be held. Japan's leaders were able to claim they had done their best. So at the most general level, the bomb served to deflect blame from Japan's leaders. Both attributing Japan's defeat to the bomb also served three other specific political purposes. First, it helped to preserve the legitimacy of the emperor. If the war was lost, not because of mistakes, but because of the enemy's unexpected miracle weapon, then the institution of the emperor might continue to find support within Japan. Second, it appealed to the international sympathy. Japan had waged war aggressively and with particular brutality toward conquered peoples. Its behavior was likely to be condemned by other nations. Being able to recast Japan as a victimized nation, one that had been unfairly bound with a cruel and horrific instrument of war, would help to offset some of the morally repugnant things Japan's military had done. Drawing attention to the atomic bombings helped to paint Japan in a more sympathetic light and deflect support for harsh punishment. Attributing the end of the war to the atomic bomb served Japan's interests in multiple ways, but it also served U.S. interests. If the bomb won the war, then the perception of U.S. military power would be enhanced, U.S. diplomatic influence in Asia and around the world would increase, and U.S. security would be strengthened. The $2 billion spent to build it would not have been wasted. If, on the other hand, the Soviet Union entry into the war was what caused Japan to surrender, then the Soviets could claim that they were able to do in four days what the United States was unable to do in four years. And the perception of Soviet military power and Soviet diplomatic influence would be enhanced. And once the Cold War was underway, asserting that the Soviet entry had been the decisive factor would have been tantamount to giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Guys, uh, <laughs> what do you think? The, by the way, this has this took uh, many hours for me to read multiple times and summarize it for you. I know it took uh, me probably 20 minutes uh, or 15 minutes reading this very important uh, research and article for you, but I think it's very important for us to uh, shed light on such a research on this particular day and during this particular time, especially that Japan is commemorating the uh, 78th uh, anniversary for the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, atomic bombings. And because uh, there is now uh, a blame game um, against Russia that uh, all this, uh, uh, let's say, volatile situation uh, is uh, because of Russia. And nobody wants to speak about the enlargement of NATO to the borders with Russia. And everywhere they enlarge and expand, they put their nuclear weapons there against Russia which is crazy, right? And the problem is that the Japanese prime minister, he doesn't even mention the United States, he's blaming Russia and everything. That's why I wanted to make this because it bothered me. And I wanted to read and dig in a lot and see what are the alternative facts about this case, right? And one of the people who spoke about this case is also Nelson Mandela. And uh, this is what he says about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And if there is a country that has committed unspeakable atrocities in the world, it is the United States of America. They don't care. They don't care for the human being, for human beings. When Japan was retreating on all fronts, 
They decided to drop the atom bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Killed a lot of innocent people who are still suffering from the effects of those bombs. Those bombs were not aimed against the Japanese. They were aimed against the Soviet Union to say, look, this is the power that we have. If you dare oppose what we do, this is what is going to happen to you. Because they are so arrogant, they decided to kill innocent people in Japan who are still suffering from that. Who are they now to pretend that they are the policemen of the world? What I am condemning, what I am condemning is that one power with a president who has no foresight, who cannot think properly, is now wanting to plunge the world into a holocaust. Yeah, who are they to pretend that they are the policemen of the world? Unfortunately, this is a correct uh, a statement by Nelson Mandela, whether you agree with him ideologically or what he has done during his life. But this is a big lesson for us to learn that the U.S. Uh, bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not because to defeat Japan, but to send a message to the Soviet Union. And now we have uh, the NATO enlargement on the borders with Russia. And I'm not saying that uh, Russia doesn't have international aspirations and ambitions. And I'm not saying that there was no injustice under the Soviet Union rule. Of course, there are so many people. Uh, sometimes I go to Armenia and when I listen to older generation and some, some of them, they are completely against the Soviet Union and against communism. And they have their point of view. And I respect that. But... Uh, the Soviet Union didn't use nuclear weapons. This is what I'm trying to say. And the atomic bomb or the current uh, situation is not because Russia has an uh, ambitions to occupy all of Europe, just like they claim. Because uh, And also they make so many contradictory statements about this. On one hand, they say Russia has run out of weapons. And then they say Russia is going to conquer entire Europe. I mean, they're not, they don't even have an established strategy about this. But anyways, I made this video because of the... Um, the dignity of the people. There is a collective dignity, right? And I, I believe that it's very important for the people to um, to accept this uh, value and believe in it. For example, what, what keeps the Syrians fighting for almost now 12 years against the CIA-led regime change war? And they're now 90% of the people below the uh, poverty line. They're starving. It's their dignity. And of course, there are so many people they are playing on the, let's say, this... Uh, sensations and these feelings that yeah you're poor now you are starving and everything so give up you know and what have we gained after all this war and resisting the american imperialism in syria we have become poor and we're starving we cannot yeah i understand uh, people are angry and mad but still the collective conscience of the people it's based on dignity it's the dignity that keeps them fighting uh, after all these years. And the same thing can be applied on the Palestinian people, the Palestinians in the occupied territories. Why are they resisting? They are every day under occupation. They are on, Every day they have to pass Israeli occupation checkpoints. They have to pass um, the, uh, the lots of security um, uh, like measures every day, like uh, detained, shot, and so many horrible things that happen to the Palestinians. Right? But what keeps them resisting all these decades? It's their dignity. And I think this is uh, also what uh, the Japanese have to do. And I'm not saying that they don't have a dignity, but at least they have to uh, speak about the American crime that was committed against them. And this should start from the prime minister of Japan and then to the people. And probably the, the case is uh, that after the defeat of Japan and the occupation of Japan by the United States for many years, they can change the educational system. They can change all the political system and they can change, they can, they can create a system that operates and evolves around the American values and the American written history so that the people can be indoctrinated after one, two, three generations and they all believe in this. And I doubt that so many people in Japan know about these uh, facts. But uh, here we are on Syriana Analysis. We're bringing you this uh, historical context. I hope you appreciate it, guys. So let me know your opinions. What do you think about this case? And uh, do you think that uh, the atomic bombs ended World War II or led to the surrender of uh, Japan? Or 
it was the invasion of the Soviet Union that uh, fastened the end of this uh, conflict with Japan. Europeans matter, guys. I'm following, and you can see I put all the likes. I just want to make... Uh, uh, two knots before I end this uh, video. One, uh, in the past video, I was wearing uh, this olive uh, green uh, shirt or t-shirt. There was uh, uh, the logo of um, um, some t-shirt on it and the people were telling me that this is the same. Uh, bulldozers are um, ruining the homes of the Palestinians. Uh, uh, this t-shirt was, uh, I received it as a gift from my cousin in Canada. And uh, yesterday or the day before, I just uh, wore it. And some people were pissed off, I think right, uh, rightfully so. So I, I will never dress that again. But secondly, I was reading uh, the comments also about me selling uh, or offering you guys to buy a vitamin D supplement on uh, Syriana Analysis, which I am I am an affiliate. Uh, I, I'm posting an affiliate uh, link in the description and also pinned in the comments below. And uh, guys, I'm not forcing anyone to buy anything. It's just a suggestion for you if you like to buy uh, vitamin D three K two, which is very important for. Um, um, uh, strengthening your immune system and I said that in the previous video it doesn't replace your immune system it doesn't replace your uh, diet it doesn't replace your um, uh, practice and everything but it's a supplement it adds on it right so some people were like angry and mad in the comments I don't understand why people are angry I'm not forcing anyone to buy anything <laughs> It's just a voluntary thing to do. But uh, we, as also independent journalists, we have to find ways to survive and make money because we also have bills to pay. We also have rents to pay. We also have electricity bills that have uh, become 100% uh, more expensive and everything is becoming more expensive here. So don't blame us uh, to or me uh, for being an independent journalist and trying to make a living uh, out of uh, trying to educate uh, lots of people on Syrian analysis and getting so much also backlash for it, right? Um, I'm doing this and uh, I was able to choose the, uh, let's say, the easy way. I chose the hard way. I paid the price for it. I um, I don't regret it, but I also have a living uh, to afford uh, here, right? So that's all, guys. If you want to buy the um, the vitamin D3 K2 supplement. It's in the description below and in, pinned in the comments below. This is only for our American audience, for those who want to buy it. But if you're in Germany, I will also put what I uh, take uh, here in Germany. You can also find it. It's on uh, affiliate uh, link as well. You don't pay any commi any extra money for it. I just take a commission from it. So this was all for today, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. I've been your host, I've been your host. Kevo Kalmasian of Siviana Analysis. If you're new, please subscribe, hit the like button, and also share this video with your friends. And we will see you next time.